Hello, uh, this talk is called Modern Open API Tooling and we're going to look at some proper handy tools for the whole API lifecycle. I'll explain what all that means in a second, but first, real quickly about me. Um, my name's Phil Sturgeon, I've been working with APIs for ages, uh, I've been helping people make better decisions, doing API consulting, um, working on building and developing and designing and reviewing um, different people's APIs and, and just helping out in the space any way I can. You might remember me from such books as Build APIs You Won't Hate, um, or the newer one, Surviving Other People's APIs, which is more about stuff on the consumer side, um, which is pretty interesting and important in an API interaction. You gotta think about the client a whole lot. Um, I'm talking about open API tools today because I've been involved with designing, building, maintaining, um, consulting, testing, or reviewing every popular open API tool that's out there in some form or other. But first, we have to stop and ask, ask ourselves, what is open API? Uh, it's a standard specification that helps you build HTTP APIs, so REST or REST-ish, um, and it's designed to make things easy for humans and computers to be able to under, uh, understand an API's capabilities. And so you're kind of writing down everything that an API could or should do um, in a way that can be read by a computer or a human in theory. Uh, this is mostly used for documentation, but increasingly it's being used for loads, loads more. It's okay if you just use it for docs, but I wanna to talk to you today about how OpenAPI can help you out with every single step of your API lifecycle. Um, and before we get into the lifecycle stuff, yes, unfortunately, I'm talking about YAML. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can do it in JSON too. And there's editors that exist so that you don't have to look at the actual YAML under the hood. Um, but this is what OpenAPI looks like if you're not familiar. You list out your endpoints, you list out your methods and your statuses and all the HTTP stuff um, is written in this format. So the API lifecycle, if you're new to the concept, is the idea that there are these two feedback loops that continuously guide the um, production and consumption and therefore ongoing evolution of your API. Um, it's never really done. Back in the day, we just say, oh, you need an API, let me write some code and then throw it at you and hope that it's okay. And then you'd say, I suppose it has to be, uh, or you'd say, no, that's useless, and, and then they'd have to go back and write some more code. It's not the most efficient way of doing things. Um, so this idea is a bit more um, thoughtful, and um, it starts off down at the bottom there uh, with define. This is talking about API modeling, figuring out what, what functionality do you need from your API? What's, what's it actually meant to do? Um, what do the stakeholders want from it? Uh, what do the teams actually need before you start kind of thinking about the, the the code or even the endpoints or anything else? Because that comes in the next stage, design. Once you've kind of agreed with all the stakeholders what you're going to be working on and what, what problems you're trying to solve, you can then start to think more literally about what endpoints and properties and um, data formats and, and everything else your API will have. And you can then pick whether it's going to be better suited as GraphQL or gRPC or, or a, you know HTTP, whatever it is. Um, then you get onto the development part. You're going to start writing some actual code. And, and the code that you're writing is hopefully taking advantage of that design and you're making sure in the testing phase that it, it definitely does match up to, to that design um, because OpenAPI is a uh, machine language, so you can use that for um, contract testing. And then you're gonna try and secure that API, hopefully, you're gonna think a little bit more about security um, before you deploy it because you want to make sure that you're not just post uh, just deploying completely insecure nonsense and then when you deploy it um, people are going to start using it but you want to make sure um, that you're observing what's going on to make sure that things aren't breaking all over the place or going really slow and then if that works you're going to distribute that out to lots of uh, lots of end users 
who need to be able to discover it somehow and then need to be able to evaluate if it's going to work for them, um, integrate with it to try and actually do stuff. Um, and then they'll need to test the code on their end and they'll deploy their apps and websites and they'll observe that and then that will feed back into kind of problems and feedback and user requests and everything else, right? So there's this entire life cycle that OpenAPI can actually help with every step of the way. You can do this without OpenAPI, but here are the tools that help. To start off with, this has got nothing to do with OpenAPI. Um, you need to talk to actual humans and find out, you can do it on Zoom calls, you can share your notes in Google Docs, you can use any collaboration software that you want to figure out what actual requirements um, do, do these people have. Uh, not just the developers, but the actual kind of business and product people of those teams. And that can be um, actual paying customers that you're letting into like a pilot program, or it can be uh, different teams at your company that are going to use your API. Whoever's actually going to use it should be involved with the planning process, right? This this shouldn't be controversial. Um, we'll blast past that and get onto design where Open API plays a bigger role. So this is where I, I used to work at Stoplight, and I was really excited about Stoplight Studio because it's a GUI, um, a graphic interface on top of. Uh, all that gross YAML underneath. So you can build really complicated, um, or you can describe massive APIs without ever having to actually look at the YAML, which is quite nice. Um, and unfortunately, they've kind of got rid of the, the free downloadable desktop version. So you kind of have to work in their semi-walled garden that you can import to and export from. Um, not ideal. So instead of, I, I like to keep my open API in my GitHub repo, um, and completely under my own control. And you can you can do that through Stoplight Studio, but you have to like commit back to the Git repo, which is all a bit awkward. So I use that less now, and I, I've started looking at uh, the Redockly VS Code extension, because honestly, I, I got good enough with OpenAPI that I didn't really need to worry about using a GUI. Um, and the fact is that this um, Redockly thing is still text-based, but you're doing it in VS Code, and it adds all this amazing autocomplete so it can actually help you like peek at definitions and like find where things are referenced. Um, and it does a lot of very clever autocomplete. So for me, using the text isn't, isn't so bad anymore uh, using this extension. Develop, everyone's favorite. Uh, <laughs> now to developing, uh, a lot of people's favorite phase. Uh, some people's least favorite phase. I kind of am increasingly going off writing code, honestly, and I want to make my life as easy as possible. Um, so one tool that can do that is uh, Juxt. And um, Juxt Site version two is this really cool, completely different approach. Some of you might have worked with uh, mock servers before. Uh, there's Stoplight made something called Prism where you point it at an open API and then it just pretends to be an API. Um, and that's kind of cool. That's more like useful in the design phase. Uh, phase, but when you start when you start actually developing your API, you you kind of want it to do more business logic than most mock servers can handle. Um, but Juxt uh, kind of takes you a lot further than a mock server and through into like sandboxing and stuff, which we can talk about. And then if you if you don't like the idea of handing over all your development to some <laughs> mystery black box, you can use uh, server side validation middleware, which I've written about on the APIs you won't hate blog. Um, and basically means you don't have to waste time rewriting the contract that you just wrote in OpenAPI. You don't have to write it all out again in, um, in your own code. So let's look a little bit at both of those. Uh, this is Juxt. It doesn't really have a good UI for me to show you. It's, it's entirely like CLI, it's a Docker instance, um, and it's got an API that you can use to uh, administer things or a CLI helper. Um, but basically, you tell it where your open API is, and then it knows what all the resources are and endpoints, and then you kind of configure it with a bit of code. And based on how much configuring you do, it's, it's, this will either be just a mock, which is kind of like a dumb API. Um, it could be built to be a sandbox, which is like an interactive kind of, an interactive API that has some actual business logic in there. So most mocks will just say, thank you for sending me a dog here is a cat in response because all I know is that I've been taught this one generic pet example and I can't think. <laughs> and then a sandbox is more like um, 
is actually going to save the specific instances that you've sent it and could actually do a bit of logic on there and it could like calculate tax on a field for you accurately instead of just kind of replying with a dumb pre-programmed example. And then a prototype is a bit more of an addition on top of that. Maybe that's something you actually deploy somewhere and it could, uh, it could be the alpha or beta version of your software um, or it could even be version one or version two. Um, and then eventually you rewrite it. Kind of just like how you might use a no-code solution like Airtable to see how far you can get. And then version two of your API might be one you code yourself. Maybe Juxt Site could become um, the first version of the API that you use for a while. And maybe you never need to replace it. Um, or maybe you get as far as kind of an alpha and then, and then decide to start writing your own code. But I quite like exploring ways that don't involve jump straight into writing loads of code. And the fact that this ties in with OpenAPI and can teach it about lots of your resources just seems really helpful to me, especially as it has OpenAPI and, um, sorry, it has uh, OpenID and uh, OAuth and a bunch of these other standards built in so you don't have to mess around writing all of that stuff or configuring some package. So the other approach I was talking about is validation middleware. This is super handy. I try and do it all the time. Think about your open API. It's a list of endpoints, methods, um, and like request bodies that you've defined in JSON. And all of those properties have, this is a name and this is a string and this should be uh, an email address and this should be uh, date time and these age must be greater than this, right? All of that stuff you wrote in OpenAPI is then gonna get used for your docs. And so you wanna make sure that your code agrees. And what better way to make sure that your code is definitely doing the exact same thing as your docs than by pointing it at the exact same artifact, right? Like you can point your code using a simple middleware in any language you're using, Ruby, PHP, Java, Node, Python, anything. Um, there's, a, there's a really cool middleware out there for you. And this one in Ruby, the example is committee. You can just say, my open API file's over here, and it'll go, all right, and then it will bounce any requests that come in that are nonsense, and it will only let through requests that are valid. So you might want to do a little bit more validation once it gets to the API to be like, do you have enough credits in your account to do this thing, or is this email address unique? But you can skip all of the, is this an email address, and like, is this a date nonsense that you have to write in your controllers? or models, or wherever, both sometimes. Um, testing, not everyone's favorite topic, but pretty important. Uh, you're gonna wanna use, what, what sort of tools, what sort of testing do you do right now? If nothing, ooh boy. Uh, <laughs> if you already have a test suite, you can use Spectator for PHP, for Laravel, sorry. Uh, you can use Jest Open API, you can, Again, pick a test suite. There's probably an open API extension or, or tool that will help you um, add assertions to your test suite that can just kind of make you find out if your response is correct to um, the open API that you said. And um, another another type of testing is like chaos testing. Um, I quite or like fuzz testing. So I quite like mayhem because it will try and it will try and break your API in a bunch of ways. Uh, let's have a look at both of those a little bit more. Uh, contract testing being the idea of does this data match this contract? And normally you end up writing the contract all out in your contract tests. So now you've repeated yourself in sometimes in your code, in your documentation, um, in your validation <laughs> and in your uh, test suite, which is pretty annoying. Um, this uh, tool Spectator is built for Laravel and you can set it up and say, hey, my open API is over here. And then based on uh, the requests being made in your test suite and the responses that come back, you can add these little assertions that say, and that should be valid, right? Um, and that saves you manually in every single test suite writing out what valid means because you know what valid means. It means it matches the contract. And then the, your tests can spend far more time and effort and energy focusing on making sure that the business logic works and, and doing the actual 
functional testing that you needed to do instead of mucking about in every single test with is this an email address, which is incredibly boring. And it also, I found that people would get fed up of repeating that and they'd put some contract testing in the first couple of tests and then they wouldn't put it in the other ones. And then, you know, those more complicated tests are the ones that actually had the contract violations in them. Um, so this means you can easily add it to all of your tests and make sure you have far better test coverage. Uh, the error output looks a little bit like this. Um, it can help you spot things you didn't notice. It might help you spot an error with your open API, which is pretty helpful because then you're, you know, it will make your docs better. Um, but it's also helped you um, discover a mistake with your code, perhaps where uh, you were expecting a property to be in there and it wasn't in there. So whether that's a mistake with open API or with your code, you can figure that one out, but it's caught it for you. Then we've got uh, contract testing, sorry, uh, mayhem testing, <laughs> which I've uploaded here. I've uh, created a project on the mayhem uh, hosted uh, SAS. I've told it where my open API file is and um, it is now going through the open API file uh, and pointing at a real instance of my API. Could be a staging or a testing or a QA or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's talking to a real version of my API and it's trying to find all of the problems. And according to this, there's quite a few problems. Um, I've got a few errors that I should have defined that I've not defined. And I've got some some things that should be 404s showing up as, four, uh, as 500 errors and things like that. So I've got some um, some mistakes to fix in my API and Mayhem helped me find them. Then there's securing. Uh, something that people often don't really spend too much time on, um, but these tools make it a little bit easier. Mayhem itself will give you some security advice. Um, a lot of these tools are based around the OWASP API security advice, and there's a bunch of, OWASP is like some bunch of, uh, you know, people have done research on what the biggest security vulnerabilities are in the world, and specifically to API security. Um, and these tools have kind of implemented that advice as automated checks. And depending on the tool, depends what it's looking at. Both of these tools are mostly looking at the open API definition and they can look at that and go, oh, you've not defined any security, that's strange. Or these endpoints all have security, but that one doesn't, is that intentional? Um, or you've used uh, numeric IDs for your data, that means that people could download all the information just by adding one to the end of it. All of these, um, all of these things you, you kind of want to avoid. And so 42 Crunch is a hosted solution where you have to try and jam your open API up into it somehow. Um, I don't think it will look at your GitHub repo, which is something that I always prefer. I like my open API to live in my GitHub repo. So as I'm developing it, as I'm updating, um, adding new endpoints, adding new properties, uh, fixing mistakes I've noticed in contract testing, I want that to be there with my code whilst I'm making those changes, living in the same pull request, not just the same GitHub repo. And I don't think uh, 42 Crunch does that. So I helped to build Spectral, um, which is kind of a, a generic um, linting tool that can do all sorts of automated like checks on your open API but it I specifically built this spectral OWASP rule set to look at as many of the OWASP rules as it could uh, when it looks at your open API so it can look at your open API and say ah oh, come on you're using HTTP basic can you not use basic that's the least secure thing use something better. Um, and it can give you all of these kind of um, concerned bits of feedback wherever you do your open API. So whether you, you can run this in the CLI, continuous integration, you can bake that into VS code if you want. Um, and that's just, that's just one way of getting security feedback on your open API. There's a lot of things it can't tell you, um, but it's tried to answer as many questions as it could by looking at the requests and response and information as it is defined in open API and the rest of it You've got to check yourself. Deployment. Uh, you might think OpenAPI doesn't really have much involvement with deployment, but it can. 
Um, getting the code deployed up to whatever hosting, not not so much. But um, once you are in production, you can you can hide behind a API gateway to protect your API from all sorts of nefarious activity. You can um, you can add rate limiting so people don't just absolutely smash your instance with with a bunch of fake requests. Um, there's kind of extra security checks in some of these. There might be bot detection. There's authentication as well. So you don't have to like code that into every single one of your APIs and then have slightly different versions of the same auth server being slightly different or different authentication strategies being used by 10 different teams for no obvious reason. You could just bake that in at the API gateway level. And both of these API gateways, they're both considered like new and interesting and different, um, not your granddaddy's API gateway. And uh, yeah, Zooplo here, for example, that will look in your, you can connect up a GitHub repo. All of the Zooplo config lives in that same GitHub repo or Git repo, sorry. And, um, and it can look at the open API that is also defined right next to it in that same Git repo which means that you can add new endpoints over time and it will become aware of those new endpoints over time. Um, and, it can, and it can help keep an eye on your open API as it changes and offers documentation and a bunch of stuff we can talk about in a minute. Um, and Tyke, which also supports open API, but in a slightly different way. Um, it will look at the requests coming in and much like the server-side validation that we talked about earlier, uh, it can actually do the same thing. It can do request validation at the API gateway level, which I think is really interesting because that means much like rate limiting is kind of rejecting requests that are coming in too quick, this is just rejecting requests that are dumb, that are wrong, that they haven't even taken the time to format themselves correctly or they're sending bad information. You can make sure that your API instances aren't being pestered with irrelevant traffic so they can focus on like saving the important things and making money or whatever um, fewer in fewer fewer instances having to run your more complicated business logic instead of this highly optimized api gateway that exists only to say like yes or no you may come through the gateway or not um, so that i think is really interesting and when i've talked about this before people had concerns that like what if you know i've got I've got my validation code in my API, whether it's automated, uh, whether it's automated with Open API or not. You might have uh, Open API validation at the code level and also at the gateway level. They might be saying different things, um, but the fact that it's based on Open API means the functionality will be the same. It's just the format, and you can train both of these types of errors to use the same error format. Hopefully you can use RFC 7807, which is like the standard error format. And if you do that, then it doesn't really matter where the error is coming from. They're both the same. Um, and, and so that's pretty interesting. And I want to play around with that more. Uh, observation. Uh, observe. <laughs> the A stage people think about a little bit less they only really get around to when things start to go wrong. <laughs> um, why is this broken? I don't know. How can I get more insight? I don't know. <laughs> Two tools that are pretty good for this. Uh, there's a few knocking around, but um, Treble is really interesting. You want to you wanna deploy that as soon as you can. Um, you can, the, the way that Treble works is you can install it kind of in your code and then it can report various happenings. And again, it, it, it's aware of your open API, so it can be smart about what, what problems it's seeing. This doesn't match that. Um, but it can also you know, do loads of other more general API monitoring. This endpoint is slow. Um, this endpoint's giving a lot of errors, things like that. And that's done from the kind of code level. You're installing it and it is reporting that there is a problem. And then Tyke, if you happen to choose that uh, as your gateway, it can track all sorts of interesting metrics and analytics. Think of, you know, all of this stuff is like Google Analytics, but for your API. It can track um, incoming problems uh, through the API gateway. But if you're using uh, if you're using a service mesh, you can tie Tyke and the service mesh together so that any requests coming from your API to another 
there's a you know maybe there's another microservice that you have to call in the in the chain it will actually add kind of traceability um, through that using open telemetry so you can see a talks to b talks to c and you can find out where in the chain something got slow or something got wrong um, so that is pretty handy and then finally distribution um, you need to get your sweet sweet api out in front of loads of other people and um, one way of doing that is documentation Another way is um, kind of a developer portal, which is a bit of an e expansion on the very simple um, uh, documentation, which when most people talk about documentation, they mean like, here is the API reference docs. You're going to see the words get and post quite a lot, <laughs> and it's very technical. Um, and then there's other like guides and, and information and things like that. And so Zooplo allows for a mixture. Um, of of kind of guides as well as the API ref docs. But what I think is really cool is that because Zooplo is handling your authentication sch schemes, it knows, you know, you've got open uh, ID or you've got whatever password system or whatever authentication strategy you've chosen. Because it knows all about those and is administering them, it can allow you, uh, your users, a way to sign up and say, I'd like a, a, an API key for that, please. Right there from your documentation. That's usually the hardest part. Because if you use a tool like um, Stoplight Elements or Redoc or Swagger Hub, they'll say, you need a, a, an access token to get into this endpoint. But there's there's not really any good way of getting one. And if, if there is a way of getting one, you need to have made that authentication system uh, work in the back end like it might provide the front end for getting it but you have to have built all of the logic to to handle those keys in the interface for it um, and so this does all that for you. It, you you can just go to the documentation and click i would like to make a, a, a an application to work with your api and it takes you through that interface and then gives you your tokens at the end and then because you're logged in it can say would you like to use this access token that's really cool that saves so much work um, I'm really excited about Zooplo, um, and I need to get around to playing with it more because that fundamentally is just a fantastic idea. But I'm equally interested in, in Fern. Um, I was playing around making an SDK for my API, and an SDK, if you're not familiar, is like software development kit, and it usually means like, here's a Ruby gem you can install to work with my API easier um, than writing a bunch of uh, garbled Ruby code yourself, which is what a lot of the other documentation tools will show you. They'll say, here's an example of some PHP you could use to interact with the API. And it's like, curl this and grab that. And it's a lot of code and it's not very nice. Whereas with an SDK generator, it's actually, it's actually built some code for you to make it a lot simpler and you just kind of plug the access key in. And then all the, all the interaction you're doing is more languagey than it is HTTP. One problem you often get is you've built this amazing SDK and no one knows that it exists because in your documentation, it's got HTTP examples or curl examples or these generic code examples. And you have to try and find some way to hack it in. But because Fern is, um, you can host your open API with them. You can send your open API off to Fern. It's got a hosted cloud that will provide this online documentation for you and it will generate you your SDK, it can put its SDK examples into your docs for you, um, which means you don't have to worry about trying to hack it in. It's really clever. I only wish that I could combine both those things because then I'd have like uh, an API gateway that is reading open API from my, my repository and like doing all this amazing stuff with documentation, giving people access keys, making an entire amazing developer portal, and then also putting a, a pre-generated SDK in there. Oh man, that would be really cool. But for currently, they don't do that, and I'm gonna try and get them talking to each other. Um, but depending on what you're more interested in, you can pick one or the other and get sweet API docs and a thing, um, SDKs or uh, authentication. And so there's a bunch of other stuff we talked about in the consumer lifecycle, OpenAPI and JSON schema, which is part of OpenAPI kind of, let's not get into it. You can use those at various different stages in the consumer lifecycle. Um, but if you would like to learn more about that, you can read my book, Surviving Other People's APIs. It's available on two good bookstores. Um, and uh, yeah, 
give me feedback. Like, loads of people are buying this. No one's said anything. I don't know if people are just being polite, but like, I want to hear what you think because then I can make it better. The first book, Build APIs You Won't Hate, got loads of feedback. And some of y'all were mean, but it helped me make the book better. So please, please get in touch if you like it, hate it, something in the middle. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. If, if you're interested in any of the things I've been talking about, because that was quite quick, um, apisyouwon'thate.com has loads of blog posts about all this stuff. And um, I'm Phil Sturgeon on all of the social medias that are good and X. Uh, and then openapi.tools lists all of the tools I've been talking about. So if any of that stuff sounded interesting, just go to openapi.tools in your browser and you can find any of it and you can play around with it. We've got a Slack channel on APIs you won't hate too, so you can swing by and ask for help with how any of them work. Cheers, folks. <laughs>